Thank you for joining the League of Women Voters presentation of a short history of voting in the United States. The League of Women Voters has been involved in the protection of voters and the voting process, voter education and advocacy for over 100 years. There are over 800 state and local leagues in the United States. During election periods, the local leagues join with other nonpartisan organizations to sponsor events where the public can meet candidates and ask them questions. We coordinate with these groups to develop written information for the public and local media about how to register, how to vote, and who the candidates are. All year round, we offer opportunities online and in person to help citizens register to vote. We also work with and monitor our local board of elections and election services staff to assist them and assure that all voters' rights are protected and that all votes are counted. Since the passage of the US Constitution, the question of who can vote, how we can vote has changed and is continuing to change. This short review of voting outlines the history of these changes and how we got to where we are today. So who gets to vote? In the beginning, the federal government played no independent role in deciding who could vote. If a state permitted a person to vote for the representatives to that state's legislature, the constitution made that person eligible to vote for the members of the US House of Representatives. Since it was the individual states that determined who could vote, what the qualifications were and how ballots would be cast, the result over time was considerable variation from one jurisdiction to another. These differences continue in effect today. Most states permitted only white men who owned property to vote. However, even in the beginning, freed slaves could vote in some states and women could vote in New Jersey. The property requirements were eventually eliminated and by 1857, virtually all white non-incarcerated men could vote, although some states still required the payment of a poll tax. Once virtually all men could vote, the question of the rights of enslaved people to vote provided the next challenge to the voting franchise. The states that relied on enslaved labor wanted to ensure that any new states admitted to the union would permit slavery. The unwillingness of the federal government to permit expansion of slavery became a central issue fueling the start of the Civil War. Both the states that permitted slavery and the states that did not wanted to be sure that neither side got the political upper hand by having more votes. During the Civil War, in an early example of presidential executive war powers, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. In addition to stating the intent of the government to free enslaved people in the Confederate States, it permitted freed slaves to fight for the Union, increasing the Union's fighting power. Although 3 million Confederate slaves were eventually freed as a result of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, their post-war voting status was uncertain. First, to ensure the abolition of slavery was beyond legal challenge, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was adopted. By January 1865, both houses of Congress had passed the amendment and it was swiftly ratified by the states. It was not enough to legally prohibit enslavement. The next question was precisely what that freedom would look like for freed slaves. Should it be a gradual granting of rights? Should freed slaves be sent back to the colonies in Africa? The idea that immediate and full rights of citizenship should be granted took some time, but finally the simple straightforward wording of the 14th amendment made all native born or naturalized people full citizens of the United States with equal protection of the law. It passed Congress in 1866 and was ratified by the states in 1868. The next step was to assure that the citizenship rights granted by the 14th Amendment would include voting rights and set a federal standard for all states, providing that neither color, race, nor previous condition of servitude could be a restriction on a citizen's right to vote. The federal government was now directly involved in the assuring of voters' rights. 
but this did not stop the states from adding restrictions, which were not specifically based on race, color, or enslavement, but were not consistent with the intent of the 15th Amendment. The overall result of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment was that under the Constitution, all male citizens could vote. This substantially changed the makeup of the electorate in many states, as many states had more non-white citizens than white citizens who were now eligible to vote. During the Reconstruction era, from 1866 to 1877, freed male slaves could vote. And for the first time, the legislatures in the former Confederate states had black members. This change in the power structure was unacceptable for many voters in the former Confederate states, and they attempted to circumvent these changes. In addition to the effect of the post-Civil War amendments, Congress passed laws that attempted to prevent states' rights to limit full citizenship rights to freed people. It also sent federal troops to the former Confederate states to enforce these laws. Armed opposition to the federal enforcement arose and non-governmental groups challenged the federal military with violence breaking out when these paramilitary groups, including the Ku Klux Klan, White League and Red Shirts fought to maintain white power, protect white supremacy and control the state governments. With the withdrawal of troops from the former Confederate states and the resulting end of reconstruction in the late 1870s, the former Confederate states tried to reestablish white control of state power. The laws passed by the former Confederate legislatures to limit voting included the payment of poll taxes, eliminating voting by felons and literacy tests. These states also set up complicated systems of record keeping, registration and regist residency requirements. The intent of all these laws was to limit access to the vote by non-white men and to intimidate those who would be otherwise qualified to vote. This is an example of some of the questions in a literacy test used in Louisiana until 1964. There was a total of 30 questions that had to be answered by the voter in 10 minutes. One incorrect answer meant you failed. As you can see, the questions are ambiguous and the local elections officials had the discretion to determine what answer was correct. There were a number of workarounds so that white men did not have to take these tests, including the use of grandfather clauses that allowed people to vote whose grandfathers could vote before the Civil War. Take a moment and look at some of these questions. Over time, the citizens who were being excluded by these state voting requirements began to organize, to fight back and to assert their rights. Unable to change the laws due to their lack of representation in the federal and state legislatures, those excluded from the right to vote sought remedies in the court using the 14th and 15th amendments to support their cause. The Ginn case mentioned on the slide struck down the grandfather provisions and the Smith case prohibited the holding of all white primaries. As these laws were found unconstitutional in order to continue efforts to keep the right to vote restricted, the states passed new laws that suppressed voting rights, including the continuation of poll taxes, some of which had to be paid two years in advance of the election. Finally, due to the effect of the court cases, many protests and organized opposition to state voting restrictions, the US Congress passed two significant laws. The 1957 civil rights law supported the voting rights granted in the 15th amendment and established a federal agency to assure that protection. The Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 established the right of the federal government to supervise changes to state voting laws that might impinge on the voting rights of non-white citizens. The passage of the Voting Rights Act, which at last fulfilled the promise of the 15th Amendment, is attributed to the persistence of primarily two men, Lyndon B. Johnson and Martin Luther King Jr., seen here celebrating the passage of the law a very long time in coming. 
Notwithstanding the broad scope of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, poll taxes remained in effect in some places, continuing the suppression of votes for poorer citizens. To assure that the right to vote was open to all citizens, the Constitution was once again amended in 1964, this time to outlaw poll taxes. However, even rights seemingly protected by federal law can be limited. Under the requirements of the Voting Rights Act, certain states could not change their voting laws without getting pre-clearance of the change from the Department of Justice. This was to be sure that the new law did not have a negative effect on the voting rights of minorities. This provision requiring pre-clearance was eliminated in the court case of Shelby versus Holder. After Shelby, a number of states rushed to adopt voting laws that could not likely have been approved if those new voting laws still required pre-clearance. These laws required specific types of identification and restricted provisions governing absentee voting, early voting, souls to the polls, same day registration, pre-registration for teens about to turn 18. The battle over the legitimacy and constitutionality of these laws is in the news constantly and continues to be an issue. While voting relation restrictions related to race were being considered, the question of whether women should be permitted to vote was being debated on a separate tract. In the mid 1800s, the first wave of women's suffrage was spearheaded under the leadership of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. During this time, there was considerable controversy as to whether the rights of women to vote should be interwoven with racial suffrage issues. The Civil War quieted the women's issue for some time, but beginning in the early 1900s, the question of women's right to vote arose with the second wave of women's suffrage. Finally, the 19th Amendment allowing women the right to vote was passed in 1919 and ratified in 1920. The League was established in 1920 to continue to preserve the rights of women as well as citizens to vote. How else have voting rights been expanded? Due to the impact of the Vietnam War on the youth of our country, who at 18 were considered old enough to go to war and fight, but who did not have the right to vote until they were 21, people began to clamor for that change. And in 1971, the 26th Amendment to the Constitution was passed, permitting all citizens 18 years old and older to vote. In the beginning, citizens could only vote directly for the representatives in the House of Representatives. The senators for each state were elected by the state legislatures. The 17th Amendment expanded the right to directly vote for senators, and now citizens elect both their representatives to the House and the Senate. However, as citizens, we still do not directly elect the president. Each state has a designated number of electors for their state equal to the number of US representatives and senators for that state. Although beyond the scope of this presentation, the resulting electoral college votes play a significant role in determining who ultimately is elected president and vice president. Citizens actually vote for electors pledged to vote for the candidates for president and vice president. The electors gather and vote on a specific date. The vote of the electors is then certified by the Senate. After all the battles fought to assure that all citizens have the right to vote, only about half of the citizens exercise that right to vote on a regular basis. In the beginning, the framers of the Constitution had lengthy debates about whether our country should operate as a democratic republic or limit the right to vote and thus the right to control the laws of our country to certain classes of people. As we have seen in this presentation, the right to vote has expanded over time. Now that voting is widely available for all offices, there are still a number of eligible voters who do not vote. The right to vote of the citizens of the United States remains a kind of stepchild in the family of American rights, perhaps because it is not listed in the Bill of Rights and perhaps because Americans still retain the framers ambivalence about democracy. 
Are we ambivalent about who we think should have a say in how this country should be run? In addition to those who did not vote at all, there are a number of citizens who only vote every four years when there is an election of a president and vice president. In every election, there are offices and sometimes issues that have a direct impact on our community's day-to-day -day life. Those elected to state and local positions pass laws that decide where our tax dollars are spent, establish the requirements for voting, pass criminal laws, govern schools and local quality of life issues. Ballots may also have initiatives to change our lives, including amendments to our state constitution. All matters in every election can affect your life. The League of Women Voters wants to assure that everyone who is eligible to vote does vote. Why? Voting is a right that makes our form of government work. It is the way that the average citizen can express his or her views and opinions. Voting is a right that Americans fought and died for. It is what makes us a democracy and it gives you the right to complain if you don't like it. The late Congressman John Lewis eloquently described our voting privilege. Your right to vote is precious, almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. The most important thing to learn from this presentation is that now virtually all US citizens have the right to vote. The ways, places and times that you can cast your ballot vary from state to state and from time to time. There are organizations that will help you secure your ballot and help you get it to the proper place so it can be counted. In addition to the help provided by the political parties, there is a list of nonpartisan organizations at the end of this presentation that will also help make your vote count. If you do not vote, remember that bad politicians are elected by good people who do not vote. Continuing battles over who gets to vote and when they are and when are being debated in many state legislatures at the present time. The outcomes of these debates and subsequent legislation will affect how and where you can vote in the upcoming elections. If this presentation has convinced you that you want to do more to support voting rights, and if you are asking what else you can do to consider the suggestions on this slide, pick one or two and become more involved, more informed. The League of Women Voters has up-to-date information on specific elections. Check their web website listed on the next page. Contact any of the agencies or organizations listed on this slide for more information on voting rights and voting issues in North Carolina. Remember, your vote is your voice.